I cannot claim like Mr. Dreyfus yesterday three languages, but at least two. And even though, as representing New York, I will chair this day in English, I also have to remember that I'm here in my native city, and I will therefore use my mother tongue to say bonjour, uh, collègue, mesdames, messieurs, soyez les bienvenus. It's getting to be on into the Congress, but I see that still many people have the stamina to be here. Uh, our first speaker this morning is Peter Mudd. Peter Mudd works as a union analyst in Chicago, Illinois. But that is only a part of his many activities. His qualifications are numerous and impressive. He serves at this time as the executive director of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago, and he is the director of studies of its training program. Any one of you who has done that knows how much work that entails. As the editor of the International Abstracts for Analytical Psychology, he tirelessly sends us forms, reminders, and occasionally even dunning letters asking us for the contribution we should have submitted automatically. But we're not very good at that either. He's a highly organized and organizing person. I've always found it a pleasure to serve on any committee with him. His clarity and his grasp of the issues are priceless, and he always seems to be prepared. More relevant, however, to his topic and the theme of his paper today is the fact that Peter, for several years, worked in a hospice where he administered a service and also counseled patients and families, an experience that qualifies him especially well to speak to us today on the dark self, death as a transferential factor. Peter Mudd. Uh, before I begin the paper, I'd like to say as the chair of the editor's meeting, it's Friday at 4.30, not today. Don't come today. Well, colleagues and friends, it is truly a great honor to be permitted to address such an impressive gathering as this one. I would like to express my gratitude to the Congress Program Committee for their confidence in my proposal. And I hope that my presentation proves worthy of the time and attention provided for its consideration. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the many authors, some of whom are present at this Congress, whose work has provided direction, support, and inspiration for my own small contribution to our field. They are too numerous to all be mentioned by name, but nonetheless, I am indebted to them and want to offer my sincere appreciation and respect. My main goal for the morning is to place before you a theoretical model which derives from and embodies the variety of encounters I have had with death, including my own survival of a near-fatal illness 20 years ago, my work with dying persons in a hospice program, and my ongoing analytic practice. Because the time is short, I will have to be content to present the model as the central feature of the paper and offer a somewhat cursory examination of the analytic implications of that paradigm. I am here assuming that our discussion will allow the space for a deeper exploration of these and other areas. Statements like, it won't kill you, do or die, dead serious, scared to death, death and taxes, a matter of life and death, and innumerable others, each refer in a somewhat indirect way to our shrouded awareness of the omnipresence, intensity, and ultimate nature of death. Our commonplace everyday anxieties concerning any form of risk, failure, need, limitation, all of which inhabit the darker reaches of the self, 
ultimately can be traced to the ego's most dreaded fantasy, its own extinction. We can glimpse in these expressions, which invade our daily conversations, just how powerful an influence death exerts on our everyday lives. Yet awareness of this inevitable fact of the human condition is apprehensively fragmented and obscured by the illusions that attend the self-preservational drive, what Freud aptly called the ego instincts. Despite the ego's horror in the face of its own mortality, death has tremendous psychological utility. It is, in reality, the primary catalyst for individuation and offers us the opportunity to enter our own destinies by passing through the ego's illusions into the ineffable essence of human life. O oh, young folk, the Zen master says, if you fear death, die now. Having died once, you won't die again. The wisdom of this advice challenges us to surrender to inevitable fate and embrace the dark self in order to gain true selfhood. It exhorts us, long before actual physical death, to undergo a process that will release the ego from the slavery of the self-preservational instinct into a far fuller life. The model I will present represents a synthesis of aspects of the work of many theorists from a wide range of psychoanalytic schools of thought and some original work of my own. My greatest debt, however, is owed to C.G. Jung, whose pregnant, somewhat offhand sentence in his book, Symbols of Transformation, began a process of consolidation of my own wandering ideas. That sentence reads, and I quote, the neurotic who cannot leave his mother has good reasons for not doing so. Ultimately, it is the fear of death that holds him there, unquote. Jung, as he often did, wrote this sentence but did not pursue it with any specific or detailed analysis. He was satisfied with the essential correctness of the statement and left it at that. Here I found a meeting place with Jung that inspired me to fill what I saw as a gap. Intuitively, I agreed with what Jung said, but my relentlessly pestering thinking function demanded more detailed analytical answers. What is the relationship between the parental image and self-preservation was the central question that demanded examination. This led me to Freud's concept of the superego, where the parental image is enshrined for better or for worse, and to the further question of why the superego had such a compelling and numinous character. Jung's essay, A Psychological View of Conscience, provided an illuminating distinction between Freud's superego as a constructed conventional conscience derived from personally conditioned experience and the self as an inborn natural conscience with inherent authority. I was taken by the obvious validity of both concepts and wanted to understand the processes whereby the one is created and the other discerned. This led directly and inevitably to parent-child relations and even further into the foundations of all human relationship. This paper will emphasize the transferential implications of this exploration. Consider the child in utero, an image ripe for the speculation and projection of all humanity, an image so powerful that it occupies a central position in nearly every mythological and religious system and serves as one of the most poignant symbols of human potential and hope. This image serves as the starting point for my own theory-building efforts as well. As a kind of caveat, let me say that the words, ideas, and diagrams that follow are presented as a general paradigm for conceptualizing experience. I concede, in fact, I insist from the outset that infinite variations are both possible and probable 
because each individuation process is by definition unique. Yet I also contend that individuation unfolds within an archetypal context that inherently assigns a quality of fundamental sameness to each unique process. The pattern I will outline is imagined as taking place within the normal range of pregnancy, birth, and developmental experience and is viewed as entirely natural and non-pathological. It is a description of the interior detailed workings of Jung's general remark about the fear of death. The theoretical model I am proposing suggests that the fear of death or the self-preservational drive is the prime mover in object relations that field where the internal and external worlds penetrate each other and intermingle to create the psychological structures and the sustaining illusions that govern our lives. Identity, or what Jungians call persona, and its fraternal twin, the shadow, as well as the constructed conscience, which Freud termed the superego, are all spawned by the ego's struggle with the paradoxical nature of the self, the light and dark of life and death. The death experience is propulsive, catalytic, and continual. Most often it operates from the unconscious depths and influences our every action, but it must be allowed to break the surface of consciousness if life is to unfold in some approximation of its completeness. Mortality underlies relations with the self and with others and facilitates, often quite unpleasantly, the psyche's compensatory self-regulating process, which reaches its pinnacle in the capacity which Jung termed the transcendent function. I will propose to you that the transcendent function is built on the prototypical experience of living through the threat of physical death and is nothing short of the ego's achieved capacity to repeatedly die an ongoing series of conscious, voluntary, psychological deaths in service of individuation. Further, I will propose that it is human relationship which provides the sacred space within which we learn to die and which enables the transcendent function to evolve into an operational psychological reality. Nowhere is this more true than in the analytic relationship. I want now to outline and illustrate in some detail the archetypal pattern which promotes and contains this process. Could we have the first slide and bring the lights down now, please? I think we need a little more dark. Thank you. This first diagram depicts the interpersonal and intrapsychic dimensions of intrauterine existence, which form mirror images of one another. In other words, the relation of the fetus to the mother is analogous to the relation of the ego to the self in the Jungian sense. I am proposing as a premise that ego development begins in utero, and I ask you to accept that premise as a way into the model. The intrauterine condition is a state of symbi a symbiotic state of fusion and interpenetration existing between the ego and the self with only the vaguest sense of any differentiation. This interpenetration is represented by the dotted line, which defines the hazy boundaries of the ego. This relationship is quite similar to Stanislav Grof's basic perinatal matrix number one, as outlined in his book, Realms of the Human Unconscious, with the crucial distinction that Grof does not utilize Jung's notion of self as a central organizing and containing agency. It is also related to Fordham's idea of original self. This stage of ego life is characterized by qualities of relative blissfulness 
effortlessness and omnipotence because the distinction between ego and self is nearly non-existence, in non-existence, excuse me. Feeding, holding, and waste management, life support systems, are all totally automatic processes provided by the mother, and their automatic character creates the paradise-like nature of the womb as the Garden of Eden. We have the next slide, please. Diagram two depicts the changes in this state as pregnancy progresses. The steadily shrinking amount of space, the increasing development of the child's physical, sensory, and mental capacities, and the normal impingements of pregnancy induced by the various forms of maternal stress mutually interact to steadily narrow the symbiotic openings in the boundary of the prenatal ego. As these openings close, the process gradually creates a dim but growing sense of separation. In other words, the ego feels progressively acted upon, which implies otherness, separateness, and potential independence as well. Next slide, please. We have the next slide, please. Thank you. This diagram depicts, much too non-dramatically, the birth process. During the birth process, the prior and slowly decreasing state of cosmic unity is radically shattered. Blissfulness becomes threatening panic and anxiety. Effortlessness becomes an intense struggle for survival. And omnipotence is challenged by a new sense of fragile vulnerability. The mother and child, the ego and self, are propelled apart, and the first basic splitting process prepared during intrauterine life explodes into a new intensity, and the fundamental pairs of opposites are fully activated. Among these are life and death, pleasure and pain, hope and despair, and perhaps even good and evil. Birth is the first death experience. The encounter at birth with death as a physical process of extinction is the prototypical experience of ego relativization, which will later become psychologized and, in quotes, remembered as the central emotional feature of the transcendent function. The capacity gained at birth or at other critical points in the life cycle to face and survive the physical threat of death underlies the ability to let go, to change, and to meet destiny. The birth process calls to mind Plato's image of the first humans as described by Aristophanes in the symposium. These humans, you may recall, were round creatures with two heads and two sets of limbs who were so content with themselves they felt no need for the favor of the gods and so neglected their obligations to make proper sacrifice. The gods, in their narcissistic rage, wanted to destroy them for their arrogance. But Zeus saw a more advantageous solution and decided instead to split them in half. The result was, and I quote, when the work of bisection was complete, it left each half with a desperate yearning for the other. And they ran together and flung their arms around each other's necks and asked for nothing better than to be rolled into one. So much so that they began to die of hunger and general inertia, for neither would do anything without the other." Unquote. These images could just as easily depict birth trauma and anaclytic and postpartum depressions, where traumatic separation is the key feature. Remembering that intrauterine experience has been hypothesized to be a relatively blissful but gradually diminishing fusion state between ego and self, I would suggest that the unconscious and predominantly somatic recollection of that immortal state 
is the fundamental underlying experience which structures all subsequent images of goal-oriented striving. In other words, we are programmed by the combination of having occupied this state and then losing it to thereafter perpetually seek re-entry into its conditions because they promise a restoration of a sense of immortality. Next slide, please. Diagram four depicts the partial simulated return to the intrauterine state through an experience of what might be termed the externalized environmental womb. In a kind of yo-yo-like motion, the ego and self separate, retouch, and even intersect, especially at times of satisfying need fulfillment. But with the crucial difference that processes that were once automatic, feeding, holding, waste management, and so on, are now fulfilled according to the level of attention offered by the parents or other caretakers. For better or for worse, the nature of the parent-child relationship will determine the stability and efficiency of the developmental process which Fordham has captured so beautifully in the concept of deintegration. In normal development, what has been termed the facilitating or average expectable environment, the good enough parent, the process of optimal frustration, etc., now begins to simulate intrauterine conditions to an adequate degree while simultaneously teasing the child ego into greater consolidation of its unit status by failing to duplicate exactly those same conditions. Each so-called failure interrupts the ego's persistent, omnipotent fantasy of fusion with the self and the parents as part of that self. This developmentally necessary failure exposes the child or ego to the same set of responses, fear, vulnerability, and helplessness, which occasion birth, but in significantly smaller and less intense doses. Perhaps a less abstract image will help to communicate my point. In the movie Jaws, the initial appearance of the shark is especially disturbing. A playful, attractive young woman cavorting with her lover swims out into the ocean at night, only to be brutally mauled and killed by the demonic great white shark. This experience is analogous to the birth experience, with the critical difference that in birth, the infant survives. As you'll also recall from the film, when the shark is nearby but unseen, an ominous musical theme played on a cello arises. That music never fails to evoke the memory of that first horrible attack, and whenever we hear it, we are immediately apprehensive and on edge. The music is directly analogous to the smaller doses of affect associated with birth or reminders of death's presence created by the environmental failures I'm describing. The ego re-experiences the presence of death through a process for which I would propose the term somatic intuition, a bodily knowledge or awareness of the presence and possibility of death that promotes an ever-increasing awareness of separation between ego and self and between parent and child. The euphemism, to know it in your bones, captures this concept well. It occurs to me that much of the recent development and interest in the field of psychotherapeutic bodywork can be traced to this idea of somatic intuition. Somatic intuition is clearly a pre-verbal mode of perception and communication with the self. And body work aims to recover the data of that communication. Ultimately, this data is presented within the containing vessel of relationship to a more developed ego 
that is experientially enabled to come to terms with its impact. This oscillating process of arousal of death fears through delays in need fulfillment, followed by good enough gratification, is paralleled by a steadily developing ego strength. These parallel processes eventually lead from primary reliance on somatic intuitive perception and the activation of primitive flooding responses to a predominance of cognitive mental perception and the development of psychological structures which can begin to cope with the powerful affects. Consciousness could be said to be clearing up. We have the next slide, please. Next slide, please. This diagram depicts the state eventually achieved by this process of teasing deintegration, which reaches a critical point somewhere in four to eight months into postnatal development. The steady dosing of death fears and their subsequent mitigation, accompanied by significant increases in ego functioning, has gradually enforced a creeping sense of separation between child and parent, ego and self. Imagine a scale that represents the ego's relationship to the self. In utero, the scale is strongly tipped in favor of merger with the self and a sense of omnipotence. Birth puts a significant weight on the other side, followed by very small but consistently mounting weights added through the so-called failures to exactly duplicate intrauterine conditions. It takes somewhere between four and eight months before the scale tips toward the side of ego self-separation. As the scale tips, a profound realization now thrusts itself upon the ego. The realization that it is, in fact, not identical with the self, and that the parent is not an aspect of that self, but an entirely separate being on whom the ego is utterly dependent. This is a psychological event of the greatest imaginable magnitude, because the prior eroding fantasy of omnipotence is shattered in a way that up until now has been impossible. The death fears erupt into a new level of clarified consciousness, and the ego is split away from its identity with the self as in birth, but with a qualitatively different awareness. Ego consciousness has attained a consolidated, clarified mental capacity that results in the firm establishment of I-other relations. The intense anxiety induced by the ego-self division sets off a fundamental archetypal process that encompasses a new level of identity formation, complex building, persona shadow differentiation, and superego construction. Next slide, please. The loss of identity with the self, experienced in the realization of the I-other nature of relationship, creates something of a panic and leads the ego to seek the security of that omnipotent lost self in order to reestablish the prior balance of the pre-split period. Since the ego has realized that the now separate other is far more powerful, the omnipotent aspect of the self is assigned to and located in that other by projection. In other words, the ego's lost sense of numinous, omnipotent identity with the self is now out there. This is depicted in diagram six. The parents are essentially deified by virtue of this sacrificial projection of the self which could be understood as an oscillating projection that is out there more often than it is in here. In other words, out onto the parent more often than it is contained in the child. The deification of the parents and the ego's new, frightening, non-numinous dependent state 
leads to the child's need to accommodate to the will of these new gods in order to ensure self-preservation. These accommodations, because of their self-preservational efficacy, are internalized or interjected and through repetitive effectiveness lead to the construction of the superego and other complexes. The numinosity of the self, which is projected into the parents, who are then in turn interjected, contaminates their imagos with a psychological radioactivity that lasts most, most lifetimes and imparts an enormous sense of authority to those imagos. These internalized parental deities, what Freud called the superego and what I would call the causers, then preside over the development of the persona and shadow and determine in great measure the contents and feeling tones of the complexes. These processes are essentially simultaneous and create what I would term the caused personality. In other words, parental direction becomes divine law and carries with it the threat of death as a consequence for disobedience. The child, affected by the loss of identity with the omnipotent self and its relocation in the parents, becomes a supplicant offering sacrifice to the supreme beings who govern his or her fate. The laws of the gods are carved into the psyche of the child and his or her obedient conformity becomes manifest in the persona, while disavowed impulses are relegated to the shadow. This act of propitiation buys the benevolence of the gods and with it an illusion of a share of their immortal status. In a very real sense, the reality of death by virtue of this sacrifice of self is pushed deep into the shadow and is overlaid with self-preservational structures that promise protection from death. This consignment of death to the unconscious is entirely appropriate because it enables the ego to thrive through achieving a state of confidence in a protective God. The famous studies by Spitz of infants without consistent positive caretakers poignantly describe the failure to thrive syndrome, which can be viewed in my model as an inability to locate and form a relationship with the lost self via projection onto a consistent object. Process that is first characterized by panic and fear gradually transforms into a withering, pining descent into despair and literal death. Nobody's out there. A typical feature of this process of self-projection, which I have encountered many times in practice, is that of orbiting. The numinosity, omnipotence, or immortality of the self lifts off from the gravitational field of the ego complex and attaches to the parent around whom the ego then orbits. The stability of this orbit and the sense of security it provides is determined by the psychological proximity and empathic concern of the caretakers. This state is what I would term degravitated affiliation because it describes the interim nature of the ego self relationship at this stage of development. It is neither here nor there or it is here and there. This space between ego and self is the space which is involuntarily and fearfully inhabited in borderline states and is precisely that which is voluntarily traversed when the transcendent function is active. If we hold this image and examine the etymology of the word transcendent, which means to climb across, we can begin to see the vital importance of this aspect of individuation. Herein lies the potential for consolidation of imaginative capacities or the agony of being unable to move through transitional spaces into newly evolving stable spaces. Could I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> 
This process of sacrificial projection facilitates socialization, ego consolidation, the establishment of adequate defenses, and provides the basis for solid interpersonal relations. But it also contains a serious danger. The sacrificial projection of the self can intoxicate a parent when that parent identifies with the numinous, omnipotent aspect of the projection, usually because of his or her own inadequate resolution of this phase of development. The result can be a destructive limitation of the child's developing personality when the as-if self parent does not adequately return the self by dosing it back through processes of mirroring, supporting, and containing the developing child. This is illustrated in the final diagram. This crucial process, which I have termed the stable dosing response, <coughs> excuse me, means a consistent and continual reinstallation of the projected self into the child. Another way of imagining this process is as a feedback loop where the child projects the self onto the parent and the parent feeds it back to the child in proportion to what the child can integrate. Kohut describes a related process as transmuting internalization. The key here is to gauge the dose properly. The parent who fails to reinstall the self becomes a vampire-like glutton who feeds on the idealization process and cannot tolerate its appropriate gradual reduction. This, of course, is a danger in analytic practice as well because projection of the self is the most fundamental element in the transference relationship. The true self is thus obscured and the development of a stable ego self-axis is retarded. This negative process leads to serious disruption of the self-regulative element in the psyche and frustrates the eventual activation and consolidation of the transcendent function. The vampire parent or analyst undermines the development of a personality with a coherent internal organizing center by refusing to relinquish the claim to be the source of life and death. A crippling, addictive dependency on a projected, externalized center is thus set in motion. This denies the ego access to the fullness of the self and usurps the self's innate right and ability to activate and direct the unique individuation of this particular child or analysand. This parental theft of the self's authority offers new psychological meaning for the motivation for the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. The parent has become a false idol, not unlike Aaron's golden calf, whose image offered an assurance, albeit a false one, of self-preservation in the anxiety created by the absence of Moses during his visit to Sinai. This model of the false god, the external self who promises immortality in return for continual sacrifice and compliance, is the pattern which underlies all relationship. The process which facilitates the building of critically necessary psychological structures is essential to the healthy development of all human beings, and it is only the degree to which we recognize, intuitively or otherwise, the nature of this dy dynamic that differentiates pathology from health. The parent who feasts on the self-projection engenders conflict and inner division because the true self of the child is obscured by the controls of the inflated parental image. The self's regulatory function of compensation invoking the first commandment will attack the false gods internally and constellate rebellion through an energized shadow. This process then leads the ego to a bewildering multitude of conflicting impulses and responses which undermine gen genuine stability and hamper the efficiency of deintegration and adaptation. Quite frequently, this process leads to a rigidified clinging to the persona 
whose enactment is demanded by the self-preservational instinct and to an inappropriate reinforcement of the defenses protecting it. This is because the shadow contents and impulses activated by the self's compensating function are associated with death and revive the powerful, terrifying affects that reside in the shadow. A vicious circle is set in motion that stunts the movement of individuation and produces a one-dimensional caused personality bound by a rigid ideology. In these cases, as Jung repeatedly warns us, the source of this tragic process is the unconscious, unlived lives of the parents, which are projected into the children for fulfillment. This vicious circle is what could be called individuation by proxy or individuation by annexation. The child is essentially appropriated as a psychological surrogate or stand-in who lives out some aspect of the parental self. These unlived lives almost always turn out to be elements of the parental self that were consigned to the shadow by the very same dynamics which are now visited upon their children's psyches. As the Bible says, the fathers taste of sour grapes, but the children grit their teeth. When parents assume an attitude that I would characterize as custodial, they rely less on this dictator style of child rearing by annexation. This means the development of a less perfect child in favor of a more complete child. It eventually means a more imaginative, self-reliant person instead of a precisely trained, compliant individual whose soulfulness is buried under the defensive structures of self-preservation. This relationship with the vampire or false god results from the mishandling of the stage of degravitated affiliation and orbiting. Instead of stable dosing, the self is withheld by the causer for narcissistic reasons and the ego feels drained, empty and lifeless or undead. Often the image of uncontrolled bleeding or blood transfusion appears in the dreams and fantasies of persons who have suffered this fate. In the analytical relationship, this appears in the transference as symbiotic dependency idealization, deification, or negatively as profound hatred, fear, or resistance. And often it is mediated through issues around the fee and the availability of the analyst. Intense feelings of fear, panic, despair, and longing for merger often occasion the end of the hour and are particularly pronounced around times of extended separation such as vacations. What is being experienced is the fear of the lethal aspect of the self, death, constellated by the absence of the self-object. Fantasies and dreams of uncontrolled floating, being in orbit in outer space with no means of re-entry to Earth's gravity, which reminds me of Harry Wilmer's patient's dream in the first presentation, and the emergence of a kind of time disorder where the individual feels trapped in a negative eternity or liminal hell, often herald the dreaded arrival of the dark self. These imaginings attempt to portray to the ego its own situation. But because the ego does not possess a developed symbolic capacity, it is merely terrorized by the images. It is clear that there is a profound correlation between the quality of the so-called causers and the nature of the caused personality. This relationship is nowhere more crucial than in the development of the transcendent function, which underlies the capacity to imagine and yield to new forms and so fully enter the destiny of the self. As I said earlier, the transcendent function, in my opinion, is the capacity to die because it requires the suspension of the exclusivity of structures which come into existence carrying the promise of self-preservation.
If the nature of the causers is overly authoritarian and one-dimensional, the caused personality will resist suspension of this primacy and the transcendent function will remain latent. Without the transcendent function as an operational psychological reality, the fear of death or the dark self will persist as the ruling principle mediated through the superego. The true self is met with opposition because it does not conform to the causer's rules and the personality is impoverished. It begins to be obvious, I believe, that this model casts the nature and tasks of the analytic relationship into stark relief. The self-projection, recapitulated as the central feature of the transference, sets up the analyst in the role of causer and views the analytic relationship as a matter of life and death. The analyst's fundamental task, then, is to keep the patient alive while simultaneously helping the patient learn how to die. This means a steady reduction of the authority of the causers must be worked for, leading to the revival of death fears, which the analysand can then be helped to cope with more productively. Herein lies the possibility of the emergence of the transcendent function and with it the hope of personal authenticity. This process is nearly always mediated through the transference, countertransference relationship, whose most essential element is the living example of the analyst. In simple terms, the analyst must know how to die. Demonstrate that capacity to the analysand and provide a new image for internalization. The core aspect of the process is the acceptance of the sacrificial projection of the self and its being worked through via a stable dosing response. But there are often preliminary steps preceding the entry into the heart of the matter. Though we could say with some confidence that the mere request for analysis is an implicit self-projection because the analyst is already imagined to be a causer, I would view the projection as a tentative, temporary trial attempt at locating a suitable object. For the projection to take root as a viable transference, the analyst must demonstrate, not so much by doing, but by being, that he or she can carry the projection and so constellate hope in the analysand. If hope is constellated, the essential condition for the work is present. And a conflict in the analysand will be set in motion between the old causers and the new potential self-object of the analyst with the patient's soul as the battleground. The analyst must survive this trial by combat and earn the problematic prize of the self-projection. The establishment of this kind of transference acts like a psychological heart-lung machine and enables the patient to hook up to a sustaining life source while his or her own psychic organs are healed, strengthened, and stabilized. This combat between the causers and the analyst is most often conducted through the factor of resistance, which is nothing more nor less than a manifestation of the self-preservational drive which is served through the compulsive compliance of the ego identified with the caused personality. To overthrow the causers is to invite death. An essential aspect of this battle with the causers is what Jung referred to as the reductive personal analysis. Almost without exception, the material presented by the patient derives from the structural effects of the relationship to the causers, and these are the elements most likely to appear in the transference at this time in analysis. Differentiation of the analyst from the causers is the primary verbal, intellectual task of the therapeutic work and is very important for providing a conceptual space within which the analysand can begin to imagine different forms of being, 
but it is of secondary importance overall. The most essential task is simply being as the transactions of analysis proceed. I would characterize this being as the custodial attitude of countertransference that honors the primacy of the self and actively witnesses how that self is unfolding in the absolute present of the encounter. The combination of active differentiation and simple being is the key to the defeat of the causers and the relocation of the self-projection. With this event, the cause personality enters a state of dissolution and pliability, and frequently there is a profound period of disorientation which recapitulates the conditions of degravitated affiliation, but now with the hope of establishing a flexible balance and ultimately the transcendent function. The transference now takes on archetypal proportions, and the analyst, fused with the self, becomes the new causer. The nature of this causer's being and doing can now assist in the rebirth and restructuring of the caused personality, but should only act as a midwife might when she leaves as much as possible to human nature. This process of transference countertransference is identical to the self projection and stable dosing response described earlier in the paper. And it should be governed by the analyst's awareness of his or her own mortality. This means a tacit acceptance of the divine status of the causer role, which is accompanied by a continual conscious awareness that it is a temporary therapeutic illusion, and further, that it is to be diminished in direct proportion to the analysand's increasing development of a stable ego self axis. In essence, then, the countertransference is a living embodiment of the conscious capacity to die, which, in my opinion, is synonymous with the central dynamic feature of the transcendent function. As Jung states in the essay, The Transcendent Function, in actual practice, therefore, the suitably trained analyst mediates the transcendent function for the patient. That is, helps him to bring conscious and unconscious together and so arrive at a new attitude. In this function of the analyst lies one of the meanings of the transference. This process of holding through the acceptance of the self-projection, stable dosing response, and therapeutic dying leads from transference pathology to the eventual emergence of kinship libido, which can be reimagined as the mutual recognition of the common fate of mortality and the empathy that results from that shared recognition. In death, we can recognize our utter equality. Because the time is short, I'm afraid I'll have to be content with these rather limited remarks about the nature of the analytical relationship in the context of this model and leave it to my respondent and to you to pursue what you will at this point. Thank you for your kind attention. Est-ce que vous pourriez rallumer les lumières de la salle par derrière, s'il vous plaît Merci bien. To respond to Peter Mudd's paper today is David Tresson. David Tresson is a physician, but he didn't start out earlier in life intending to be a physician. He started as a student of literature, French literature as a matter of fact with a special fondness for Bossuet. Any one of you who's read Bossuet will appreciate that. Interestingly enough, he and Peter have 
and experience similar, if not common, in the, that each of them chose to go and spend one year abroad during their uh, studies in college. Peter went to Italy and David came to France, as they both needed to test and touch another aspect of civilization. But there was another pull in Dr. Tresen's life, and he did not use the fellowships offered to him to pursue a doctorate in French. He went to medical school instead. He says that it was when he discovered Jung that he could finally bring again together his interests in the humanities and in the healing hearts, arts. Dr. Tresen serves at this time on the training committee of the San Francisco Institute, where he especially teaches such subjects as the, the Kabbalah, religious experience in psychology, and transference and counter-transference. As a physician, Dr. Tresen is well acquainted with death in its personal and archetypal aspects, which certainly makes it the right person to respond to a paper on a model of the dark self and death, Dr. Tresen. Bonjour, Monsieur Dame. Uh, you know, I have to uh, tell you that um, Peter was gracious enough to send me this paper some time ago. So I've been living with it for quite a while, and you've been living with it for just this morning. Uh, it's been a mixed experience because it's been like living with death. And what I want to do in talking to you is not simply coldly dissect what he said, but share some of the experience with you of having lived with this paper over some time. So that's what I want to do. It's difficult, of course, because death is the subject. The uh, first experience I had of this paper was with my feelings. It drew my feelings and then later engaged my thinking. But the feelings were there for a long time before any thinking came into play. And my feelings responded to the theme of the paper. And the theme of the paper was, no matter how it's dissected, it's that death is the most important thing in life. It's an aggrandizement of death and the importance of uh, death in terms of the development of psychic structure. But it's, it's the aggrandizement of death. It's a pain to death. It's an elegy to death. It speaks of death as the most important thing. And I must tell you that my feelings were outraged and critical. I couldn't get over it. It was very difficult for me because this is what I was living with. I, I felt it wasn't right. I didn't want it to be right, but that's what I was living with. Later, my thinking discovered the plot, as opposed to the theme, how death creates psychic structure, the, me the mechanism by which that happens. And this I did find interesting and stimulating and even rather elegantly conceived. So I want to talk about the feelings first because um, that's what I felt first. There were three reasons why my feelings were offended. The second reason was that I felt that Peter overvalues death. The third was that I think he misrepresents death in an important aspect. The first reason that my feelings were offended was that Peter has written and delivered a highly theoretical and technical paper, very intellectual, about the most personal and intimate subject in the world, my death and the consequences of it while I'm alive. Now, mind you, this is not like a lot of death literature in that what is considered is somebody else's death in the mourning process. This says, consider your own death. Think about the extinction of your very self and what is that like. And you have to try that on in order to see what's happening. Now, I know for Peter, this is a personal document. It must be but he doesn't write it that way, and he doesn't give me any personal material against which to weigh his pronouncements, and so I'm left there doing that. And like Inanna, it's like I have to go down to the underworld by myself and hang on the peg by myself to weigh these pronouncements. When I was about eight years old, I used to, when I would go to bed, lie in bed and go through some sort of exercise with myself. In this exercise, I would pretend that if one member of my family had to die and I had to choose who that would be, 
whom would I choose? It was an excruciating exercise. I would put myself in each person's place once as the person who was going to die and once in that person's place as mourner of others. And it was very difficult and I always ended by choosing myself. It was excruciating to see anybody else that I love die like that. These are the kinds of thoughts that this paper has brought forward in me and has made me consider again. And like Inanna, I felt like when I would come up from these thoughts, I too would be dripping with death. And it was difficult. Now, I have a musician friend who is a teacher and uh, he speaks of um, ungrateful pieces of music. An ungrateful piece of music is a piece of music that no matter how well you play it, no matter how much you bring to it, it doesn't give anything back or it gives very little back. I asked myself in this early phase, is this an ungrateful paper? And I want you to know that it's not an ungrateful paper, that, I've, that I have appreciated this paper deeply, but I want to share that with you in terms of what I felt, okay? But you know, I'm still unhappy about the fact that Peter, when he did use examples, used collective sayings and homilies about the importance of death, and not his personal accounts, I would have liked at least some personal accounts, or one personal account, though he did at the beginning tell us something about how he came to this subject. Now the second reason, the, the um, overvaluation of death. Peter says that he wants death, he wants it so, death so ever present in our lives in a natural and non-pathological way, that's a quote, that it, death, influences our every action. Now, I'm not naive, I know many others think this and have thought this. I know that when Tolstoy, in, at age of about 47, had a break, from then on, death figured in his every single day and his every single action. Also, uh, Steckel, the Freudian analyst, said that every, every fear is a fear of death, actually. And um, I'm told that Sabina Spielrein also said that death is, uh, is the source of all dysphoric difficulties. Klein, of course, Melanie Klein figures death important in character development, virtually all character development, ne certainly negative character development. Freud, not so much so. Freud, for Freud, the best I could tell, the death instinct was more of a theoretical uh, consideration of the wending of all animate things towards their inanimate parts, in other words, towards entropy. But you know, Otto Rank uh, thought, as does Peter, that the fear of death at birth was the source of all anxiety. He went seeking for the source of all anxiety, and he found it in the birth experience. And it was the fear that the child would not, uh, of the child, that he would not uh, survive his emergence. So for Rank in 1924, as for Peter in 1989, life is a reaction to and an abreaction of death, actually. But note this, what Peter says about death, that it's, I quote, propulsive, catalytic, and continual, can be said equally about life. Back to my mind, it's been Jung's greatest gift to point us to the life-generating and life-enhancing aspects of the Newman, so that no matter how severe the personal life, we can be healed, at least to, to some measure, and our life can wend towards meaningful ends. I don't think that birth is even necessarily a primarily negative experience. I've, I've, de I've delivered babies, and many, and it's, I see in it le sacre du printemps. I see spring leaping forward. I do not see the terrible disruption of an ideal state. The child can't help it. He's born on something. And I don't think that moderated losses are either adumbrations of death necessarily. I don't think that death is the natural and non-pathological sole determinant of life's course. It is irrefutable that it figures in our destinies. But I think it's equally true that the life force sui generis animates us and drives us to consciousness as well. It's a matter of two opposites and of a glass both 
half full and half empty. Now, thirdly, I think Peter misrepresents death in the matter of affective tone. Even the term dark self and the title of this paper suggests, as it usually does, a decidedly evil connotation. I don't think that life is naturally played in a minor key and nominated by fear. And aside, Peter's um, musical allusion to the single cello in Jaws made me think of uh, Messian's Quator pour la fin du temps. Now, this is the quartet for the end of time that he wrote while in a stalag, I think it was in 1943, and it was played on broken instruments. The third movement, there are four movements, the third movement is called Abin des Oiseaux, the abyss of the birds. And indeed, it's strange and plaintive and otherworldly and difficult. Da, 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 I had to do that for the interpreters. <laughs> Est-ce qu'ils ont fait ça? <laughs> At any rate, uh, even in the midst of this, about one fifth into the piece, the birds come in and they sing. They're a little strange, but the birds are still singing. And this was a real situation and a difficult situation, obviously. But it's, it's not a hopeless situation, even musically. You know, the birds are still there, and the birds are still singing. When they're not, when the birds are not singing, and when life is dominated by fear and played in a minor key, something has gone wrong in my mind. Something's gone wrong in early life, or there is a clear threat of death in the present. I feel that time and maturation bring a philosophy and substance against which death does not necessarily loom as inconceivable, intolerable, hopelessly fragmenting, or as Peter says, the ego's most dreaded fantasy, and that optimistic and positive attitudes also have their counterpart in the natural instinctual integrity and élan of infancy and childhood. These are archetypes too. Life can be exciting in itself and its own raison d'être. When something goes wrong, one, does, one says, c'est la vie. One doesn't say, c'est la mort. <laughs> now, listen, let me say something to you. It's, uh, I'm not combating the paper here because we have a common enemy, and it is death. Peter is approximating himself to death, espousing it intellectually. I'm combating it and distancing myself emotionally. So, I mean, take your pick. I mean, we have to deal with it. It's a difficult thing to deal with, even if you're not in Paris in September, or August as it still is, you know. It's very difficult. Okay, enough feeling to the thinking, okay? In fairness to Peter, this paper is not just about death as a dominating factor. That's the personal test of it for me. It's about death and the fear of it as the catalyst for the formation of psychic structures and especially the transcendent function. Now, let me cite his thesis as I understand it. He speaks of a succession of subjective losses of self, be they in the self or in self objects, from birth on. Losses that are intolerable because they are analogies or representations of death. Now, seen another way, these losses imply intolerable vacant spaces that induce the formation of a structure to fill that space or to bridge it. Now, this is the transcendent function. Now, I have some difficulty with this formulation since it isn't clear to me what the transcendent function is bridging for the psychically unformed neonate and infant. Even if labeled as somatic intuition, what Peter is postulating is a very early, intact ego function. Now, I think that details are important here, and I'll say why later. But I think that this view stands in contrast to Fordham's developmental schema, which I think is the most elaborate one that we have in our Jungian 
uh, metapsychology, and for me has not been replaced by something else. That is in contrast to Fordham's, which, which postulates that no such ego entity exists at such an early age. What Peter implies is for the infant, a personal experience of loss or death is for Fordham, the impersonal and spontaneous rhythmic de- and reintegrations of the original self. That this spontaneity, he says, is an intrinsic aspect of the original self. Ego plays no part in it. What for Peter is projection, for Fordham is primitive identification. Projection is a very sophisticated ego mechanism which warrants the name only when it is about to be withdrawn. Otherwise, it's identification. For Fordham, only when the integrates of the original self connect to external factors do ego islands, or centrum as he called them, begin to form, which in time coalesce to create the ego center, or what we generally call ego. Only then is there truly a space between ego and self to bridge, and an ego to register the bridging. Nora Moore, building on Fordham, derives the transcendent function in the same way. With successive D and reintegrations, prim primitive identification yields to specific symbolic equivalents between inner and outer, and then to symbolic representations, the inner of the outer. Without ego formation, there is no capacity to symbolize and no space to symbolize across. And in the borderline, because there is a defective ego development, all stays concrete. It's a question is, can the borderline not die because he can't symbolize? Or he, he's just not developed to the point that that can happen, or at least in part. Now, Peter relates death to individuation. I think he's right. There's no, there's no doubt about it in my mind that he's right, that there is a way in which that definitely relates. But I put it together in a bit of a different way, and this is how I put it together in practice. His idea that for the analyst, the most essential task is simply being is absolutely correct. It's the same for me as the stillness of Winnicott's holding environment. And it's the relatively egolessness, the relative egolessness of primary identification in which the analyst as the surrogate parent is what somebody calls a transformational object, which is really a misuse of the word object, but a transformational object known existentially and experientially, but not representationally. And its function, simply to affect the self. And so there's a merger at this time in which that's going on. Now, when this does obtain, when this does happen in an analysis, it's reported as deep and basic love. It may happen at the onset of analysis, often doesn't. One has to work a long time before it happens. In some analyses where there's a great deal of wounding, it doesn't happen, except only in part. It lasts, when it does, an indefinite period of time. It recurs, and it persists as background. However, in time, D and reintegration cycles commence in earnest, and specific and personal work gets done around specific personal issues. And that has to do with the archetypal aspects of those issues, issues also. And this latter work, on the deintegrates is the work that gets pointed to when cases are presented and usually is the shank of an analysis. In time, though, what I see is that there comes a large coalescence of ego parts, as in childhood, but this time with a thoroughness and a deliberateness and a consciousness never before experienced, here for the first time, at the end of an analysis, not at the beginning, nor at the beginning of life, comes a death experience that is natural and non-pathological and inherent in individuation. For at this time, for the first time, can the ego contemplate with fullness of affect what it will be like to lose one's hard-gained life, not through the neglect of another, but because of one's very humanity, la condition humaine. At this point, one sees subspecie eternitatis from the eye of death. The opposite and the equal of seen from the eye of God, from the still point of the universe. This experience comes at the end of, as I see it, and because of analysis, and is an artifact of an extended conscious striving to know yourself. <laughs>
This is how death to me relates to individuation. Um, otherwise, it's like saying the wheat in the field is like the bread on the table. It is not. And yet they're related. Um, Peter mentioned Sinai. Uh, you know, the first attempt to bring the tablets down failed. It's like in the early stages, the ego cannot encompass the self. It is impossible. Donald Meltzer speaks of this. He puts the depressive position before the paranoid schizoid position, that the developing uh, ego cannot encompass, cannot encompass everything, and it breaks down into parts, and the parts allow digestion in peace and only later work to the place where the ego is strong enough and full enough to appreciate that. This is the same idea. Well, this was the experience that I had. I, I sat in a movie theater one time watching a movie about some bleakness of life and for the first time in this way, I, I, felt, I felt a rush in which I loved my life. I hadn't cared so much, really, in the past. I hadn't realized I hadn't cared so much. I was sitting there with my children, and suddenly, with a passion, it was important to me. And as soon as I felt that, as soon as I felt the fullness of how much I loved my life, I became angry. Because it became apparent at the same time that it was going to go, that I was going to lose it. And in rapid moments, uh, I flared with some anger at my analyst. I felt like he had tricked me, in which case he was the causer who had tricked me. And that passed very fast. I somehow was able to accept in that moment, though I'm sure it was because of the many years of analysis, and this was towards the end of my analysis, it passed very fast, and I accepted the fact of the passion of my life and loving it, and I accepted the fact that it would go. And my analyst, as I reflected on it for this paper, at that time he was Tiresias, he was the Sphinx, he was just another person who was going to die too, looking on. Now, you know, Ronk knew all about this. At one point he had the idea of setting a date for termination early in each analysis in order to accelerate this experience. He gave that up. But he thought if he could do that, that one could have that experience in toto. Now, Peter suggests that a person can help this process along by actively espousing imaginal death. Uh, is this possible? Well, first of all, it's, it's damned hard to do. It's very difficult to do this. It's, it's like doing a self-analysis in a way. It's very difficult, at least for me, Peter, to do that. It's, I, I can hardly get into it before my mind wants to go to something else. But to be authentic, it seems to me, the death experiences need to come as a timely part of the overall process of development. And like any technique, this may or may not work, or it may work sometimes. Now, as for Peter's overall theory, if we grant him the possibility that deintegration is a kind of death and has dysphoric affects that the ego will remember in time, and he does speak of that. The ego will remember when it comes into self-consciousness. Then his theory works, and truly, is elegantly coherent. I think that speculation on the minute details of pre-verbal development at this time in psychology is perhaps the most interesting and exciting area of depth psychological inquiry. Although it's difficult, if not impossible, to use direct observation to prove what is subjectively true for the infant, it's of the greatest importance that theories be formulated so that we can attempt to understand otherwise baffling psychic states that come up in analysis and also commonplace nonverbal reconstructions that get in the way of what we think should be going on in analysis. Moreover, each theory that we have, and this is where I think the detail becomes important, it is important to really think in detail what you really think goes on in development, That's because, though this is myth, actually, when you get into the reaches that the mind cannot fathom factually, for a myth to be truly binding, 
Best did not contradict what one can see. If the details take you beyond what you know and yet do not conflict with what you know, there's a kind of gripping belief that comes from that. At any rate, each theory has its own treatment implications. Peter's schema paints the picture of the analyst titrating the patient's frustrations, mirroring him carefully, ever in danger of invoking his dark self in more than optimal measure, but needing to allow it nonetheless to promote psychological growth. It is an ideal model for keeping an eye on pathology, on difficulty in early life that wants to express itself, for seeing it, for working with it intelligently, and Peter's paper talks about that. He, his theory is here, but he talks about what can go wrong. And true, you'll see what can go wrong according to that model. On the other hand, Fordham's schema suggests a less tense dialogue in which both patient and analyst participate more democratically and equally in the shaping of the integrates. Now, patients are all different, and also each patient and each person is different at different phases of his own development. And so maybe one model applies at one time and another applies at another, and it's good to have more than one way of seeing, I think. One person who changed was Otto Rank. He changed his mind, at least his emphasis. He decided that the life force, especially embodied in human creativity, propelled individuation instead of death doing so. And like Jung, he postulated a psychology of emergence and growth in contrast to the then prevalent Freudian model of consciousness rising as a byproduct of conflict. For this, like Jung, but 12 years later, he was ejected from Freudian circles. Both Jung and Rank, after writing books on how consciousness emerges, emerged themselves in significant ways. Now, in the same vein, Peter has written of consciousness and it's a large job he's undertaken. He is undertaken to write how human beings become conscious. It's very large. And when someone writes like this, I think that not only do they work on these ideas, but the ideas work on them, and that what is happening is some kind of urge towards emergence. I don't know where Peter's going. He said nothing personally about that. The dark is still very present in his paper, but I think that this tradition I speak of, of seeking self through scholarship, is well served by his paper, and may it lead you to greater and greater light. I've been very stimulated by your effort, and I thank you, Peter. Thank you for your attention. I'm afraid that the time has run out and we will not have time for questions from the floor. I'm sure that both of the speakers will be glad to answer any questions you might have. Uh, but my sense in listening to them this morning is they have just begun a dialogue, which is probably going to go on, if not between them, at least within them, for a long time to come. Maybe you should go out to lunch together. Back at 11 o'clock.